Hi there, friends. It's been quite a while, quite a while, a couple of weeks or so. I've uh, been living life. Recently came back from, well, uh, the trip of a lifetime. I went to Boston, uh, Massachusetts. I went to Concord, New Hampshire. And without even planning to, also ended up in Salem. But uh, other than the wonderful bookstore rating, apple the picking, and hiking, I ended the trip by visiting one of my favorite authors of all time, uh, someone who I think is one of the greatest living writers of all time, and possibly even the Herman Melville of the 20th century, Alexander Theroux. We ended up talking for about two and a half hours at his home in Cape Cod until he had to go pick up his children. It was surreal. It was delightful. It went perfectly. Uh, and yeah, pretty much speechless. That's about all I can say for now. Uh, but there's pictures you can see on my Instagram, my Twitter, uh, and all those social media avenues. But this is what I got from going to Boston and the surrounding area. I went to about eight or so bookstores. Many of them were duds, but the ones that were good tended to be akin to paradise. And I came away with quite a bit. As you can see here, you, the stack almost rises to heaven. Uh, and let's start with the first one. This uh, so when I left Alex's home, I asked him for recommendations in the area, and he told me to visit the Sturgis Library, which I did. Didn't have much of a selection. Uh, then I went to Parnassus. Parnassus. Took my car to Parnassus. And that is where I found El Señor Presidente, the President, by Miguel Angel Asturias. And if you've seen some of my other videos, you know that I've been collecting this forgotten Nobel winner. And I had a paperback of this, but of course the first edition hardcover is much, much better. And so I'm very happy to have found this. A friend of mine, Brad, is actually sending me uh, another book by him called The Green Pope. And that means, once I have all those, there's only one major novel of his that I'm missing. Strong Wind, which I hope to acquire soon, and then breathe through his oeuvre. And I got a nice bookmark here, Parnassus, Cape Cod's independent bookstore since 1975. You see that? And it has a quote from Emily Dickinson. There is no frigate like a book to take us lands away, or any courses like a page of prancing poetry. And yeah, there's a, that bookstore, I'll say, had a pretty damn good selection, but the conditions, the conditions of the books uh, left something to be desired. Lots of foxing and things of that nature. But uh, let's just read a random excerpt here. Fidina took the frock from her husband like a flag of peace, and sitting on the bed began to tell him excitedly that it was a present from General Canales's daughter, who had been asked to be godmother to her first child. Rodas hid his face in the shadows surrounding his son's cradle, and without hearing what his wife was saying about the arrangements for the christening, he put up his hand irritably to ward off the light of the candle from his eyes, and he quickly snatched it away, shaking it to cleanse it of the red light which clung like blood to his fingers. The specter of death arose from this child, from his child's crade. Is that a typo? Crade? Cradle, as if it were a beer. The dead have to be rocked by babies. The specter was the color of white, cut was the color of white of egg with cloudy eyes. It had no hair, eyebrows, or teeth, and it twisted itself 
spirally like the inner convolutions of the censers used in the funeral service. Yeah, so this is the first American edition hardcover. Uh, not in the best condition, but for a rare book such as this, I'm grateful to have it at all. And now we're moving to another bookstore. This one I got from, you can see in the bookstore, I had the bookmark, Raven Used Books. And this was in Boston proper, I believe. And it's a first edition of Vladimir Nabokov, King, Queen, Knave, one of his Russian novels that he translated into English with his son, Dmitri. <clears throat> As you can see, the condition here is much better, much, much better. And it says here, of all the novels, this bright brute is the gayest, wrote, writes Nabokov in his foreword to this revised and first English language edition of a classic story. I have not read any of his Russian novels, so this might be the first one I read, unless I get to Glory, which I also have a copy of. And let's just see how it begins. The huge black clock hand is still at rest, but is on the point of making its once a minute gesture that resilient jolt will set a whole world in motion. The clock face will slowly turn away, full of despair, contempt, and boredom, as one by one the iron pillars will start walking past, burying away the vault of the station like bland Atlantis. Atlantis? The platform will begin to move past, carrying off an unknown journey, off on an unknown journey, cigarette butts, used tickets, flecks of sunlight and spittle. A luggage handcart will glide by, its wheels motionless. It will be followed by a news stall hung with seductive magazine covers, photographs of naked pearl gray beauties, and people, people, people on the moving platform, themselves moving their feet, yet standing still, striding forward, yet retreating as in an agonizing dream full of incredible effort, nausea, a cottony weakness in one's calves will surge back, almost falling, supine. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Let's see, okay. Now, whew. this, let's see, this stretches from here to here. You see my fingers? Well, you can see the thumb, at least. This is Commonwealth Books that was pretty much in the heart of Boston, and it had the best selection of Latin American novels I have ever seen. And it wasn't like there was a sec Latin American section. It just uh, took up the general fiction st section. There's just a huge amount, and I was so impressed uh, with that, especially because there's a lot of buried Latin American writers whom uh, I already have in my collection, such as Abel Passe and his Dogs of Paradise, uh, Joao Ubaldo Ribeiro, and An Invincible Memory. That's his novel that uh, I wrote about in my Invisible Books column. Same with the Passe I just mentioned, uh, and some others. And I came away, of course, with some of uh, some ones that I hadn't already had. But uh, this one isn't Latin American. This is, I think, the only one that isn't that I nabbed. But it was on my list. It's Dancing with Mermaids, Miles Gibson. Now look at that weird, creepy cover. That just begs you to read it or not, <laughs> or to stay away from it. Here, here it is in full. And this actually, according to the dust jacket, is an illustration by Hilary Gibson, which I'm just now realizing is the same surname as Miles Gil Gibson. So a bit of nepotism, as it were, or, uh, yeah, some collaboration, as it were. 
and this is wreathed in legends and haunted by ghosts the little seaside seaside town of ram's horn stands against the limestone cliffs of dorset close to the poisonous swamps that mark the mouth of the river she and it's supposed to be full of weird uh, eccentric things uh, some magical realism i'm not sure to what degree but here's how it starts the river Sheep bubbles from a hole in Dorset and flows ten miles to the sea. In the beginning, the river is a path of weeping stones, but when it gathers strength, it cuts a channel through the ancient chalk, and the water is cold and deep. It pushes between hills, soft as the breasts of sleeping women, and floods the road at drizzle. Beyond the village, it rattles through a dark trench concealed by trees, roars into a field of nettles, and spits at the cattle who come to drink. It is bright and wild and dangerous. Also promising. Also promising. Now, I am such a sucker for Latin American fiction, and so this was on my list, and I was so glad to find it. I, the Supreme, by Augusto Roa Astos. This is one of the great dictator novels. Uh, I believe it was Bastos, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and I think uh, Alejo Carpentier, they all agreed and challenged themselves to write a dictator novel. So this is obviously one. Uh, I do have Marquez's and I'll reach over here and just grab it to show you. It's obviously enough title, A General in His Labyrinth. Uh, this one's translated by Edith Grossman and we'll see who translated that one in just a bit. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a great subject for an essay if it isn't already written? Dictator novels, uh, either of Latin American countries or uh, ones in general, such as Gugi Tiango's Wizard of the Crow. That would, that's, an also, that's also a great portrait of an extremely capricious and delusional dictator, aren't they all? But what makes this even extra special? Is that this is an ARC and it came with a flurry of promotional material such as an awesome photo, uh, publishers weekly forecasts, uh, let's see, uh, don't run your review before publication date 1986 and just some advance praise and Alejo Carpentier he says it's a masterpiece so yeah love that love that and let's see how it starts shall we this is translated by Helen Lang by the way and it starts with a letter that is ostensibly from the dictator himself I the supreme dictator of the republic order that on the occasion of my death my corpse be decapitated, my head placed on a pike for three days in the Plaza de la República, to which the people are to be summoned by the sounding of a full peal of bells. All my civil and military servants are to be hanged. Their corpses are to be buried in pastures outside the walls with neither cross nor mark to commemorate their names. At the end of the aforementioned period, I order that my remains be burned and my ashes thrown into the river. That's some heavy stuff, is it not? Nice, uh, thick, just like I like them. Very much looking forward to this one. And now I don't even think this Maybe a different book by him was on my list, but I'm not 
too familiar with, Ronaldo Arenas. But how could you not love both this strange cover and especially the title, The Palace of the White Skunks? Leave it to, again, Latin American authors to come with, uh, to come out with, or to come up with, excuse me, amazing titles that sound, in, to some degree or another, all-encompassing, epic. This is translated by Andrew Hurley. And apparently it's part of a series. I think it's more thematically connected than anything. Uh, but I guess I'll find out. Let's see. Uh, I'm not sure, but let's read the prologue and you'll get a sense of the kind of almost, I don't want to say pleonastic, but somewhat repetitive nature of writing, which actually has a bit of a hypnotic effect. Death is out there in the backyard, playing with the wheel off a bicycle. There was a time when that bicycle was mine. There was a time when that wheel without a tire was a new bicycle, and I would ride it all the way up the street, up to the top of the red dirt hill. And sometimes I'd be going so fast, it would make your head spin and I would skid and fall off that bicycle, and it's a wonder I didn't break my neck. And my knees would be all scratched up and scabby, and I'd keep them covered so nobody would see them. I'd plaster them with mud so people would think what I had was dirty knees, not scabby ones. There was a time when that bicycle had both wheels, and every kid in the neighborhood wanted to ride it. But I told every one of them, no. So we'll probably get, I don't know, something of a Bill Lung's Roman set in Cuba. Fidel Castro's Cuba. Now this is another wonderful find from, again, Commonwealth Books. Makunama. Makirama. By Mario de Andrade. This is supposed to be something of a precursor to magical realism, primordial version of that wonderful style. And it, let's see here, it was first published in Portuguese in 1928 and is considered a masterpiece of Brazilian literature. And so yeah, this is a first edition, I believe. It's translated by E.A. Goodland. And let's see how it starts. In a far corner of northern Brazil, at an hour when so deep a hush had fallen on the virgin forest that the brawling of the Uraricoria River could be heard, an Indian woman of the Tapa, Tapanhuma tribe gave birth to an unlovely son, sired by the terror of the night. His child was an oddity, his skin black as calcined ivory. They named him Makunama, and he was to become a popular hero. Even in his childhood, this youngster did flabbergasting things. He passed the first six years of his life without talking. So again, probably a weird kind of Bildungsroman, uh, perhaps in the vein of Gunther Grass's The Tin Drum. That's just my vague impression. And I won't know until I read it. And so that's the end of Commonwealth Books Hall. Now, this is, boom, what I got from the Harvard bookstore, which is a pretty lovely bookstore. It just didn't, all the uh, used books were in the basement, and it was mostly paperback. 
I'm not much of a fan of paperback, but uh, gone are the golden years of Dolphy Archive. They don't publish hardcover, haven't published hardcover in quite some time. Uh, and this is a Dolphy Archive title that was on my list. George Anderson, Notes for a Love Song in Imperial Time by Peter Dimock. And I, one of the few reviews I read was by M.J. Nichols. And he said that it's basically indicts human rights violations such as torture and is experimental in form. So, yeah, that sounds like something that's quite an original read. There's even a blurb by Tony Morrison here. Peter Dimock possesses the rich, intricate, and subtle patternings of the verbal lace maker's craft. Well, that sounds positive enough. <clears throat> uh, the Harvard Bookstore actually had a reading, poetry reading going on while I was shopping. Uh, and although the poetry kind of sounded like nonfiction with line breaks, not really my cup of tea, it, w it really added to the ambiance of the whole thing. And I wish I lived closer to a a big bookstore like that that had a regular events because then I would go and see authors who I'm more interested in and yeah I would love to have opportunity like that because when I lived in Florida I'd have to drive about four hours to Miami to meet with authors like Salman Rushdie, Martin Amos, and Jonathan Safran Foer but yeah plenty of bookmarks to add my to my collection <clears throat> and maybe one day I'll do just a little bookmark collection video. Got my receipt. And let's see how this one starts, shall we? <clears throat> Dear David Callan, My name is Theo Fails. In the vision I had two years ago, I came to the end of myself and found other people standing there and knew that the present was a gift of time in which to sing a true history of equal historical selves. That's why I'm writing you now to request an interview. We were undergraduates together at Harvard, though our paths never crossed. I was two years ahead of you. Harvard. What are the chances of that? Harvard book at the Harvard bookstore. Seems promising. And uh, speaking of an interview, maybe I can interview him uh, if I like this book enough. So now, if you're still with me, we've come to the final book haul. And I got these all from, is there a bookmark? Uh, what is it? Started with a B. Braxis. Uh, I'll have to look it up later. But it was this is the oldest bookstore in Boston, if not one of the oldest in the world. And this is this looks like a sultry <laughs> book, doesn't it? The Three of Us by Joyce Elbert. And I had just recently finished reading some memoirs by Joyce Elbert that were published for the first time by Tough Poets Press. And, oh, almost dropped that. And so she's actually, she used to be a huge bestseller, but I mean, a lot of her books were smutty and, you know, appealing to the masses. So I'm not sure how much I would actually like her fiction. The uh, memoirs were entertaining and uh, illuminating enough as far as being a writer at that time in New York, about the uh, 60s, 70s or so, and she also traveled a lot to other places. Uh, but yeah, this is, I like the colors of the cover. And this is a rare book, so I, it was hard to pass up. So I did not pass it up. Let's see how it starts. Not a big fan of starting with dialogue, but here we are. It's been an awfully long day. It's been an awful day. 
It most certainly has. What the three of us need to do more than anything else, he said, is just plain relax. Do you think a glass of champagne might help? A glass of champagne sounds like a marvelous idea. He opened the champagne bottle and poured three glasses full. I propose a toast to the three of us, both women said in unison. The camera came in for a close-up of their smiles, their three glasses touching as the sound of organ music grew louder and the soap opera was off the air to be continued the next day. So, it's, a, it's described as a serial comic novel about the erotic life. So I'm assuming there's some kind of threesome that's gonna happen at some point. But look at the cover, the color of the book here. Nice Barney purple. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I'll give this one a chance, but you know, my expectations are gonna be pretty low. And now we have Zelda Fitzgerald, The Collected Writings. I've read her only novel, Save Me the Waltz, which is quite good, quite good. I'd recommend it to anyone who's interested or who is a fan of F. Scott Fitzgerald, anyone who's interested in the Roaring Twenties, and anyone who likes Baroque language. And she, it, this is kind of an answer, that novel is kind of an answer to Tender is the Night, and well, it's been extremely a long, an extremely long time since I read both Save Me the Waltz and Tender is the Night. I do remember liking Save Me the Waltz more. And yeah, this comes with the uh, power couple. Uh, or maybe not. But this is an ARC as well. And came with the promotional material. Charles Scribner's Sons, and this was originally published in 1991. So, pretty old ARC, not as old as the I Supreme novel I just showed you, but it also comes with some letters from her, uh, I believe some poetry, essays, what else? A play. I think some short stories. <clears throat> I'm not too sure. But let's get to the novel. I just want to show you. Now, I think the, she really focused on the opening to this novel. I'm not suggesting that she didn't work as hard on the rest. But the opening is probably one of the most Baroque parts of it. And it, and it gets a little less so throughout the rest so it begins those girls people said they think uh, those girls people said think they can do anything and get away with it that was because of the sense of security they felt in their father it was a living fortress most people hew the battlements of life from compromise erecting their impregnable keeps from judicious submissions fabricating their philosophical drawbridges from emotional, emotional retractions and scalding marauders in the boiling oil of sour grapes. Judge Beggs entrenched himself in his integrity when he was still a young man. His towers and chapels were builded of intellectual conceptions. So far as any of his intimates knew, he left no sloping path near his castle open either to the friendly goat herd or the menacing baron. That inapproachability was the flaw in his brilliance which kept him from having become perhaps a figure, a figure in national politics. The fact that the state looked indulgently upon his superiority absolved his children from the early social efforts necessary in life to construct strongholds for themselves. One lord of the living cycle of generations to lift their experiences above calamity and disease is enough for a survival of his progeny. So yeah, I hope that uh, worked as an excerpt to show you what you can expect. And I highly recommend that novel. And now, what 
are these two B, B, B inducing books. Big book boner inducing books. Oh, I'm about to show you. Bam. Bam. Can you see that? That is not only the Melville biography, but one of the biographies of all time, from what I've heard. Uh, and I even talked with this uh, about this with Alex, and he also thinks this is an amazing accomplishment. Two volumes from his birth to his death. And from what I've read of this biography, the first volume just goes so much into the nitty-gritty of Melville's family. And you think, why are you including all this extraneous information? Extraneous. And, well, that is made clear in volume two, from what I've read uh, about these books, that... Herschel Parker, the biographer, was basically trying to reconstruct the cosmos that Melville occupied and to truly track as many of the factors that gave birth to this masterpiece, the masterpiece, Moby Dick, or the whale. Uh, but I'm sure... This is going to be a challenging read. It's about, let's see. So the first volume is almost 950 pages. And I think this is probably more. Oh, closer to a thousand. So almost 2,000 words. Look at this, these beautiful spines here. And this is pretty rare to find really good near mint copies like this. And if you'll allow me to flex, I'll go and tell you that not only are these near mint beautiful hardcovers, but they're actually review copies as well. And I have here, oh, so here's the bookshop, Brattle bookshop. I was thinking of something else. I have here the promotional material and I believe that where does this one date from? Uh, it's supposed to come out. I mean, they included a lot of promo material. They really wanted to sell these huge books. It reminds me of that is it new? The uh, biography of Mark Twain, a gigantic first volume. I just see it everywhere. Uh, who knows? Oh, the lights went out for a second. Let me bring you back up here. Okay, so yeah, the first volume came out 1996. And, but so, let's see how it starts. I haven't even looked at this. <clears throat> so there's a preface that I'm skipping through. Acknowledgements. Okay. Chapter one, a flight of the patrician lustral and his second son. On Saturday, 9 October, 1830. In a hastily emptied house on Broadway in Lower Manhattan, Herman Melville, 11 years old, helped his father, Al Melville, 48, pack up a remnant of papers and odds and ends of light personal belongings that they could walk away with after dark. The boy knew they were not moving to a finer neighborhood in Manhattan as they had done every few years. This time they were escaping the island to join his mother and seven brothers and sisters in Albany forever. Herman may not have known that his father, a former importer of French dry goods, was three months in arrears on his house rent. 
that other debts were unpaid, and that Melville feared a creditor might have him arrested before he got away. But there had been no hiding from the boy the urgency of the family plight. Yeah. So, I actually had uh, the Commonwealth bookstore shipped to me. That big book haul. But I almost didn't get the Melville ones because they're, they're huge, <laughs> to say the least. But I got them $15 a piece. Re a real, real steal. Uh, let's see if I can stack these somehow. So you can look at them in full. I'm sure some of you are skipping the video. So you can just get the tiles and, and run away. And that's okay. Just give me a thumbs up right up my bunghole and I'll feel less violated. What am I even saying? Okay. Oh, there we have it. Let me know. What do you find most intriguing out of this pile? Let me know what have you gotten recently or what are you reading recently? Tell me what's been up. I want to hear about it. Give me all the literary news. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, I'm not sure when I'll have a new video out after this one. Uh, because I'm doubling down on my novel Morphological Echoes. And really want to finish it sometime uh, by the end of the year. But I definitely will not go away forever anytime soon. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you at some point.